Elevate Theatre Company is at it again. With an all-new Elevate Signature program fusing a virtual play with a panel of trusted health experts, in partnership with the American Sexual Health Association, we bring you Runneth Over, a play by Sabrina Jacob Washburn following three young women on their journey as they navigate classes, their bodies, bodily functions, and a crush on a screen star who attends their college. Through this incredible storytelling and the panel, we will help you explore themes of HPV, cervical cancer prevention, and women's health. As always, we'll break down the issues and call you to action. Join us August 19th at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Free tickets available now. Elevate Theater for Health. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Elevate Signature Program. I'm Elevate founder, Christina D. Eskridge, and I am so grateful and excited to have you all here with us this evening. For tonight's program, we have partnered with the American Sexual Health Association to provide you with more incredible storytelling the and of the play Runneth Over by Sabrina Jacob Washburn. And then we will host a panel discussion with expert health and wellness folks who are gonna help you dive a little deeper. We are honored and excited by this partnership with the American Sexual Health Association. Not only are they an organization that believes that everyone has the right to information and services that will help them be sexually healthy, they also aim to provide resources that are reliable, science-based, and stigma free. T together, we will support an open, honest exploration of HPV, cervical cancer prevention, HPV vaccinations, and other sexual health topics. This collaboration has made it possible for Elevate to continue our tradition of compensating our artists for their time and their talent, and we are now able to provide live closed captions. If you haven't done so already, please feel free to click the little CC button on YouTube so that you can see the live captions. A huge thank you to Tess Stevenson, our captioner for this evening. Tonight, myself and the cast of Runneth Over join you from the unceded lands representing the Muncie Lenape, the Wappinger, Mohican, Paguaset, Canarsie, Gabrielino, and Tongva peoples. We start each Elevate Signature program with a land acknowledgement. And this is our way of honoring and elevating all indigenous communities. We work, play, and live on lands with a rich and complicated history. And we will never forget the contribution indigenous people continue to make to our communities. We also want to acknowledge that after there were stolen lands, there were stolen people forced to work the lands and build this country. Again, we elevate and honor this contribution, this rich history, and we hope that through our storytelling, we forge a path towards a more equitable world. Learn more about the importance of land acknowledgements and the land that you reside on um, through the link that has been posted in the chat. So for those of you who are new to an evening with Elevate Theater Company, let me share that you are in for a real treat. We kick off tonight with storytelling through the incredible performance of four fabulous artists, Penelope Hines, Lydia Rice, Petra Hines, and Adrian Beidou. After the play, we will host a panel discussion with trusted health and wellness experts handpicked by the American Sexual Health Association. We will be joined by Dr. Maria Trent, Safi Hampton, Allegra Woodard, and Dr. Debbie Saslow. We encourage you to put your questions into the chat, keep, keep the chat going, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible during our discussion. I know there are several watch parties happening around the country, and I'd like to give a huge shout out to SHAPE, the Sexual Health and Peer Education Program with Teen Empower. They are streaming in all the way from Oklahoma City. Hey team. <laughs> if you are watching in a group, please 
share with us in the chat who's there what organizations do you represent how many of your friends and family are with you this evening and if you take pictures or video of your watch party tonight be sure to tag us on social media at elevate theater company on instagram and facebook please feel free to use the hashtags elevate runneth over asha sexual health and theater for health we may be gathering virtually but we are still building community and making memories right here right now so settle in get comfortable grab a snack maybe get a drink but hurry up get cozy <laughs> Because this Elevate Signature Program, in partnership with the American Sexual Health Association, starts right now. Without further ado, I give you Runneth Over by Sabrina Jacob Washburn. Okay, so everybody thought that he was going to be like a film major, theater major, acting. Totally. Stuff. I was going to get in there. I was going to make films. Right, but no, 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 no. It turns out he's into like literature, like creating okay. yeah, writing. Okay, yeah, books. Let's so we're... Books. Hi, guys. Oh, Frankie, hey. Hey, girl. Hi, sorry I'm late. I just came from practice. Okay, okay lax, bro. You're just jealous because I have bigger muscles than you. Yeah, 100%. How's the season going? Um... Yeah, pretty embarrassing so far. The one benefit is that Lori is finally starting to warm up to my advances, so I'm not too concerned with the score in most games. I'm pretty sure I saw Lori making out with a dude from SAE last weekend. Who? Nat Baker? Did you guys know he's trans? Really? I had no idea. He's so hot. Well, Lori has been out there sowing her oats with a bunch of folks, from what I've heard. Anyway, she told me that she's not that into him and she's been giving me bedroom eyes, so I'm just gonna run with it. Best of luck to you, my friend. This will make number three on the team now. What can I say? I've got the magic touch. Teach me your lax ho ways, oh wise one. Girl, you could slay some D if you just put a little effort in. It's not like I'm not trying. I'm just in a dry spell. Besides, there's no one all that interesting for me to focus my efforts on anyway. <laughs> I don't know, Nadia. <laughs> what? What's so funny? How many times have you asked me about Lucas Irving in the past week alone? Face it, Nods, you're a little obsessed. Okay, you've been stalking his Twitter feed right along with me, Monica Miller, so don't pretend like you aren't into him too. I mean, of course I'm into him. He's freaking famous, for God's sake. Hell, I'm a gold star lesbian, and even I think that Lucas is hot. I just think he's a good actor, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, good actor. <laughs> Frankie, you have to set this up. Oh my god. <laughs> you know, he basically is the smartest guy in my section of Divine Comedy, and he speaks pretty good Italian. Oh, swoon. Maybe I could invite him to a study session? Ask him for help? I mean, frankly, we might actually get more studying done if he was here. That's perfect. Speaking of getting some actual studying done, maybe we should talk about Dante now. <laughs> yeah, as much as I love torturing you nods, you're right. I have to leave right at three for a doctor's appointment. Everything okay? Yeah, no, it's fine. I just have to go to the gyno for my yearly checkup. I thought you didn't have to get a pap until you turned 21. Uh, you don't. But my mom had cervical cancer in her early 30s, a hashtag survivor. So I try to stay on top of getting everything checked out pretty regularly. My gyno is like one of my favorite people in the world. We're homies. I'm actually, I'm bringing your cookies today. 
Oh, that's sweet. Just don't ever go see the one at the clinic on campus. He doesn't make eye contact with you. I swear he never looked at me once as he had his hand up inside of me. <laughs> Felt great. <laughs> Do you like your person, Mom? Uh, I don't know. I've never been. You've never been to the gyno? No. How come? I don't know. I just haven't. I, I was seeing my pediatrician until this year when I started school. I guess I didn't know I needed to. Does your pediatrician check out your vagina and boobs and stuff? No. You do your own breast exams? No. You get tested for STDs on your own then? Why is this suddenly 20 questions? I mean, it's okay, Mon. I didn't start going to the gynecologist until I became sexually active. Ah, you're probably still okay not having gone. Well, thanks for outing my virginity, Nadia. I went for the first time when I was like 11 to get the HPV vaccine. You definitely do not need to be having sex to go and see the gyno. It's not like they stick their fingers in you that young anyway. It's just like an external exam and lots of talking. Stick their fingers? Jesus, could you be more blunt? Yeah, the talking. So ox to be telling a medical professional how many guys you've hooked up with and what base you've gotten to. God, it is time to reti retire that gross baseball metaphor already. Oh yeah, maybe instead we should get crispy with the rock and take it to the rack to the five hole. Okay, damn, you're learning. <laughs> you made me a girls lacrosse fan against my better judgment. Okay, well done, sis. Anyway, Monica, you got to get that shit checked out. You're vaginal, thank you. I'm fine, Frankie. Can we all get our heads out of my private parts now? We're just worried about you, Mon. Uh, all love, baby girl. I just know firsthand how shit can go south if you keep referring to your reproductive organs as private parts, like it's the 1950s and ignoring important health stuff. We might be young and invincible now, but cancer doesn't care how high and tight your ass is. Why are you acting like I'm sick or something? I don't have cancer, I'm fine. You're missing the point. I'm trying to help you. Well, I never asked for your help. Whoa, Monica, calm down. You know I hate it when people tell me to calm down. Dude, what is your problem? <sighs> you both come from these, like, woke families who can talk about anything. <laughs> Frankie, your mom is the epitome of nurturing and probably held your hand when you put your first tampon in. Nadia, your dad's l listen to Cardi B and smoke weed with you for God's sake. <laughs> My dad can't even say the word boob without turning purple. I, I, I never even told him when I got my first period, let alone asked to go see the gynecologist and talk about my non-existent sex life, which is just another thing that I'm behind on, apparently. Things have been a little different for me, okay? I've had to figure out all of this shit on my own. And I, I, I don't appreciate either of you talking down to me like I'm some incompetent little girl. Sorry, Mon. I didn't mean to upset you. For the record, when I was about 10, my dad's put on a video from the 90s all about periods and pubic hair and then left the room. As cool as Isaac and Oscar are, they're a little squeamish when it comes to uncomfortable conversations. At least you weren't watching YouTube videos under the covers with the sound off so nobody in the house could hear you. The first time I tried a tampon, I only put it halfway in. Went to school the whole day, waddling around with a piece of cotton, turning my vulva raw, and ended the day with a cute stain the size of Canada on my pants. Gross. The point is, we're all just figuring shit out the best we can, when we can. I'm sorry if what I said made you feel bad. I know how hard things for you were for you without a mom growing up. I might have two dads, but they both have amazing feminine energy, and they knew they kind of had to make up for the missing woman figure in my life, so... I guess they just tried harder in some ways. I never really thought about how lucky I've been before. Monica. Forgive us, please. I hope you still aren't wearing your tampons like that. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> if I want raw lips, there are other way more pleasurable ways to go about it. Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, I don't wear those cotton vagina bullets anymore. You have to try a cup. No leaks and way better for the environment. Though they can be a bitch to get out if you're not careful. Thanks for the hot tip, sex guru. Also, can you text me your doctor's contact info? Yeah. I guess me too. Sure thing. And while I'm at it, why don't I just see if my new BFF, Lucas Irving, can join us on Tuesday? I mean, it looks like today's study session is shot to L. We might actually need him if we're going to get any, or if we're going to have any luck passing this midterm. Wait, you have his number in your phone? Oh my God. Magic touch. <laughs> Nadia, 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 you will never ever believe it. My dude, Lucas is in. <laughs> Lucas Irving is gonna hang out with no, us! No, do not say his name so loudly, you're embarrassing me. Stop, stop it right now. Do not play with my emotions like this. Oh my God, is this for real? Why would I lie? Your girl came through for you. Okay, I'm calm now. I can verify nods. We are about to meet the man of our dreams. I mean, your dreams. I know, I know you have dibs. Oh you are out of control. Get the phone. Okay. We may have to push it back an hour. I have practiced the only time he's available, so stay tuned. <laughs> uh, hello? I've been waiting since this morning. Do not leave me hanging. What's the update on the Lucas sitch? I'm dying here. Homies, bad news. Slash, maybe good news for you, but I can't leave practice early, and this is the only time all of next week that he can do, so... You're gonna have to enjoy the Lucas fruits without me. <laughs> but he's hella cool though, and he's super chill about the whole thing, so just no worries. <laughs> no, 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 no. You have to be there, Frankie. Find a way to get out of practice. Fake mono. Tell them you're having a herpes flare up. I don't care what you have to do, but we need you as a buffer, woman. Don't abandon us. Mono or herpes? <laughs> Is that how you think of me? Lest you forget, I've hooked up with about a quarter of the team at this point, so me calling out sick with either of those two things will get me in a whole lot more trouble than just... Hey, Lord. Yeah. Yeah, wait up. Gotta go. Over up, Nadia. I'm giving Lucas your phone number, and you two can finish coordinating from here. <laughs> don't worry, I got you. We will meet early, do some prep, practice some talking points. We don't need a buffer. This is what we've been waiting for since August. I feel like I'm gonna throw up. For real. Should we study beforehand so we don't look stupid? What we really need to study is his relationship status. I was creeping on Insta and it looks like little Miss Chloe Grace was all over some old dude in the Maldives. Our boy is 100% single. Ah, uh, how can she move on so fast? I think they've been broken up since the summer. That's what I've been trying to tell you. Anyway, who cares about her? This is great news for us. I'm dead. Someone bury me. Tell my dads I love them. Are we still on for 30? Yes. Please don't be late. Who? Me? Late? Never. JK, I'm setting a reminder in my phone right now. See you guys. Where the hell is she? Pick up. Monica, where the hell are you? We were meant to prep before Lucas comes on, and he's supposed to call at literally any minute. Pick up your phone. <sighs> What happened to you? We were supposed to meet over 20 minutes ago. I am having an emergency. Oh my god, what happened? Are you okay? I can't get it out. What? What get what out? What if I have to go to the hospital? This is so embarrassing. Monica, I need you to take a breath and tell me what is happening. Do you need to call you an ambulance? No. 
okay? I got my period today. So? And, and, and I decided to take some advice from Reiki and try a menstrual cup for the first time. Yeah? And it's stuck! I can't get it out! Well, well, aren't you just supposed to pull on the little nub thing? I don't understand. It's suctioned to the walls of my, my you-know-what, and every time I pull, it gets sucked up there tighter! Jesus Christ. I need you to come over here and help me get it out. I can't. We are supposed to FaceTime with Lucas right now. I am not talking to Lucas Irving right now, Nadia. I am in the middle of a medical emergency. Calm down. This is not an emergency. When was the last time that you had a plastic cup stuck inside of your vagina? Listen, go splash some cool water on your face and take some calming deep breaths. Lie down on your back for a couple minutes and close your eyes. Uh, panicking is just going to make it worse, okay? <laughs> ah, uh, I'll stall him for a bit, but you gotta pull yourself together. Do you remember how hard it was to schedule this? Okay. I can do this. You can do this. Go! Lucas! Hey, what's up? Oh, you know, not much. Just a boring old Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for making the time. Uh, I know you're busy and all. Oh, no big deal. Uh, we're on hiatus this semester, so my schedule's not quite as tight as usual. How do you, how do you keep up with everything? Like memorizing lines while translating Dante? I couldn't manage it. Uh, they've been really good about scheduling most of production in the summer so I can focus on school. Uh, I actually had it written into my contract that I want to have a somewhat normal uni experience. <laughs> uni. Uni. University. Sounds so British. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Should we get started? Oh, well, we should probably wait for Monica. Oh. Why don't I give her a ring, you know, mm. hurry her along? Yeah. <laughs> Monica, hi. We are waiting for you to join us. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> that a brick woman is not going anywhere anytime soon. It can wait until after we're done. Okay. Sorry. Everything all right? Totally. She just, uh, something got, uh, well, her, uh, cat got stuck somewhere. She's having a hard time pulling it out. <laughs> oh no, poor pussy. Indeed. Should we reschedule? No! Uh... Perfect. Here she is now. Hi! Here I am! Hi, Mon! Have you met Lucas yet? He's in the other section of Divine Comedy. He's agreed to help us with the translation. Oh, yes! Hi, Lucas! It's nice to meet you. Thank you for the help. No, no, no problem. Uh, sorry to hear about your cat. She'll be fine, right, Mon? Well, she's asleep, so... Let's get started. Right. Yeah. Uh, so... If... Uh, oh. Damn, um... I'm... Uh, sorry, I've got to take this. Can you excuse me for a moment? What did you do to your face? You said pull it together. This was the best I could do under the circumstances. Has it budged at all? No. Isn't there anyone there who can help you? <laughs> my dad and my brother, neither of them are coming anywhere near my vagina. Do you have any tissues? Your mascara is running. <laughs> Shit. I'll be right back.
Really sorry about that. Um, it was about work. Uh, I might need to take another call in a few minutes, but uh, we can get some work done on this in the meantime. Oh, oh no, did we lose someone? She'll be right back. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm kind of buzzing right now. Um, can you keep a secret? Yeah, of course. That was my agent. Um, I'm up for this lead in a new slasher film. Uh, summer blockbuster type. Ooh, don't tell anyone. I, I, I'm, I'm not supposed to talk about it. Oh my goodness. Uh... First film offer. <laughs> well, potential film offer. Congrats. Do you, do you think it's a little lowbrow? Horror, uh, that's what my agent said. Lowbrow? Yeah, like maybe not serious enough for my first film. The script is supposed to be pretty gory. Not much real acting, if you know what I mean. Just a lot of blood. It's hard to be taken seriously when you're covered in blood, apparently. Uh, my agent's afraid of me getting stuck in those kinds of roles if that's how I establish myself. I think it's really cool. Whatever level brow it is, it's a movie <laughs> and gory sounds fun to me. Maybe fun is a good enough reason to do it? Yeah, maybe you're right. There's no way you're getting stuck in anything. You already show your chops in an Emmy-nominated TV series, remember? <laughs> People think actors are so confident, but the truth is it's, it's hard to know if you're doing a good job or, or making the right decisions. I, I've never felt that sure of myself, really, but if you think that what my agent said is bollocks... Seriously, you're going to be fine. People know how good you are. At least I know I do. Thanks, Nadia. Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just happy to be up for it. My cup runneth over, or, or overfloweth, or is that the saying? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and, and you, you won't say anything, right? My lips are sealed. <laughs> Sorry for the holdup. What are you guys talking about? Nothing. Nothing. Uh, were you able to get it out yet? What? Well, try not to worry. My mom is a vet. It happens all the time. They usually wiggle themselves out on their own eventually. Just give it time. Thank you for the support. Damn cats! Am I right? Oh, oh, oh man, that's me again. Um, uh, sorry guys, I'll just be one moment. I cannot believe you. Monica! Why would you tell him about the cup of blood? Why would you tell him about I the menstrual I... cup? Why? The one time I get to meet a famous hot actor and you tell him about the cup of blood in my vagina! What is wrong with you? Calm down, please! It's not what you think. Ah, don't tell me what I think! Claudia, <gasps> do not tell me to breathe, to calm down, to pull it together all week! All I've been hearing from my stupid brother is how emotional and hard Monica? Are you okay? Mon! The yelling pushed it out. So apparently it's between me and uh, one other guy. Can't say who, but bottom line is a bigger name. They want me to audition. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it's all, it's all right, but it does mean I need to cut the study session short to go over my sides. They want my tape by tomorrow morning. Okay, no problem. Hey, uh, would you, would you? Ah, never mind. <laughs> what is it? Well, this is a little unorthodox, but I, uh, I could use a reader off camera for my audition, I guess. I was just wondering if you'd be interested. Maybe come over and help me out. I, I need someone to read the girlfriend part and my roommate's voice <laughs> isn't exactly girlfriend la, dude. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes. 
Definitely. Um, I would love to. Uh, I just need to make a quick call to see if I can get out of work. Uh, be right back. <laughs> So, shall we get to work on Dante? Actually, it looks like I can't stay after all. Oh, oh no. Yeah, unfortunately a work thing came up. It, it's a bit of a deadline. Oh, okay. Sorry I took so long. I was dealing with a situation. Everything all right now? Yeah, fine. Nothing like a little blood and gore to brighten up a day. What? It's okay. I know you talked to Nadia. Oh, look, it, it's really supposed to be kept private. No one should know. Uh, not even Nadia, really. Oh, I used to think like that too, but now that I'm over the initial shock, I actually think it's kind of funny. Might as well tell the world. And, and there's no shame in a little blood. You should see it. It looks like a cheap horror film. The naive girlfriend getting stabbed as she comes out of the shower, or who is it that they kill first in those films? Is it the best friend? I don't know. Anyway, I want my brother to see it. You, you told your brother too? No, it's gonna be a surprise. First time seeing anything like this, he's gonna die. It's all good. I, I got my shift covered. I can do it. Do what? Oh, nothing. What are you guys talking about? Just talking about, you know, the little stuck problem. Nadia, you told her. What happened to sealed lips? Told her what? It was a secret. I trusted you. I don't understand. I told him all about the blood. I figure it's basically a comedy at this point, nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, more people should talk about it openly as far as I'm concerned. I feel like I'm really turning a corner here. Oh, no, Lucas, she's talking about her uh, cat problem. So your cat is bleeding? My cat? My cat is sleeping now. Rest in peace, little angel. Ugh! What the hell, Monica? Was something murdered in here? Oh my Scurvy god. You're right, asshole. I told you to stop messing with me. You murdered your pussy. What is wrong with you? Lucas, I think Murder? you are... They're literally made to bleed. Get over it. Monica, come clean up all this blood before I kill you myself. Swim in it, sucker. <laughs> you, you know what? I have to go. Nadia, I think we should forget about that favor I asked you. Oh, no, Lucas, I. Favor. D don't call me again. What was with him? You know, he was not as cool as I expected. Celebrities, they're just like us, only British. And sexy. And gone forever. What's with you? Nothing. I gotta try to get my shift back. Forget him, Nod. That guy wasn't really my cup of tea, you know what I mean? Monica! The cat just walked through the blood and now it's all over the carpet. <sighs> I gotta go. Call you later. We do still have to get through these Divine Comedy translations somehow. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <sighs> Shit. You guys. What the hell did you do to Lucas? He gave me the coldest of shoulders today. It's a long and complicated story. All you need to know is that we're about to get married and have babies, and now he thinks Monica is a murderer, and we're all gonna fail our midterms. Sounds like I should have been there after all. <laughs> what was I saying from the beginning, Francesca? No, no. I mean, been there to have witnessed this epic FaceTime go down. <laughs> I cannot wait for the tea. Monica, care to weigh in? I've been trying to reach her all day. Do you know where she is? No, I haven't seen her since class on Monday. Hi, Frankie. Why didn't you send any cookies with your friend here? Dr. Ramirez! Yo, what's up? Aw, uh, uh, you went, Mon. Good for you. How was it? I mean, not the most comfortable thing in the world, but not that bad. After the cup fiasco, I don't really care what goes up there as long as it comes back out. Um, excuse me? Long story. All a part of the murder plot. Okay. Well, uh, I'll let y'all get your shit together and you can get back to me. Not sure that'll ever really happen, but we'll try. 
Love you guys. Thank you for being my surrogate moms. Oh, I love you too, boo. Lucky to have you ladies in my corner. You make my cup runneth over. <laughs> right, mom? Ha, ha. I would love to invite the cast of Runneth Over back to the Elevate virtual stage so we can give you a round of applause and introduce everyone. Welcome back, welcome back. We'll have Sabrina back as well. Um, so that way we can introduce you all. Thank you so much. You all did such a fantastic, wonderful job. Congratulations on tonight. Um, we have uh, Petra Hines playing Penelope excuse me, playing <laughs> Monica. We have Penelope Hines playing Frankie. Uh, we had Lydia Rice playing Nadia. We had Adrian Bedu playing Lucas. And Sabrina Jacob Washburn as our playwright this evening. Thank you so much. Um, Sabrina, I know we have a full-blown interview with you um, on our YouTube channel as well as on our website. So folks can get into the nitty gritty about why you wrote this show and how it came about. But I'm wondering, how do you feel now that it's out there into the world? It feels great. It feels really great. I feel like tonight's run was excellent. Um, everyone had a really great time. I know I laughed out loud several times, which is such a gift for a playwright um, to experience the work that way. So thank you. I laughed out loud too. You all should be very proud of your work. Um, thank you so much for your performances tonight. We will go ahead and transition into our panel discussion now. So I invite our panelists to come to the Elevate virtual stage and all of our artists, we will invite you back on a little bit later. So thank you so much for this performance. Excellent, excellent. Hello and welcome to all of our panelists. We are so excited to have you and to dive into a conversation around some of the salient themes in the play around HPV, cervical cancer prevention, etc. So I'd love to have everyone go around and introduce themselves so that way our audience knows exactly who's on the panel this evening and um, what expertise you share. So um, Dr. Saslow, I'd love for you to get, get us kicked off because you are in my top uh, left-hand corner. Great. Hi. Great show. Uh, yeah, Dr. Debbie Saslow. I'm the managing director for HPV and gynecologic cancers at the American Cancer Society. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Allegra Woodard, would you please introduce yourself? Absolutely. Greetings, everyone. Allegra Woodard from Virginia. I am a cancer survivor and an advocate. And my husband and I are chapter leaders for the National Cervical Cancer Coalition in the Northern Virginia area. And we provide education on HPV vaccination and uh, cancer screening on PAPS and such. Wonderful, welcome. Safi Hampton. Hi, I'm Sophie Hampton. Um, I'm a junior in high school and I don't know, Maria Trent's my mom. So I'm kind of just here to support and kind of give my teenager perspective on things. Wonderful, that's gonna come in handy, don't worry. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Maria Trent. Good evening, my name is Maria Trent. I am a pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist at uh, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. I'm also a, a public health scientist focused on young women's health research. Well, welcome to all of you. We're so honored and, and grateful to have you here today. Dr. Trent, I'd love to start with you in terms of, you know, diving into some of the information that we saw um, in the show. A lot of the folks um, that we, or the three women that we saw in the show had varying degrees of engagement or understanding of their sexual health. And, and you work with a lot of teens. There are also a lot of teens in, on the, in the audience today. Um, can you share a little bit about when pediatricians might start the conversations around sexual health? Um, with their patients and maybe give a few tips to our teens um, and young adults how they can broach some of those conversations with their with their pediatricians. 
Sure. So I think the discussions can occur across the life course. So I'm, I'm not sure people have to wait until they come and see an adolescent young adult doctor like me uh, to have those discussions. Um, I think, first of all, parents are probably the first exposure to these conversations. Um, there are great books and things that parents can read to their children as they're growing up. So I think many of these conversations can even occur before adolescence, before it matters so much to people. Uh, but what I will say, say is in our practice, I think most people would start these conversations around 10 or 11. Um, the fact of the matter is adolescent girls will change very quickly. The median age of, of menarche or when you have your first period is around 12 and a half. So if you really wait until someone's 15, you've really missed a lot of the puberty um, window for them. So I think it's really important that as young people begin to change, they begin to have these discussions and pubertal assessments by their pediatricians. Uh, I will say that I focus on adolescents and young adults. And so we see our patients from 10 to 25 years of age. So all of those women could have been my patient. I would have cared for them all. They don't have to go and see a gynecologist. I provide all of those services to patients in our practice. And so there are many places where they can receive that care in a very streamlined and holistic way. That's really great. I had no idea. Um, it, it has always occurred to me that there's sort of this transition from, you know, pediatrics into adult medicine. And so that's really great to know that there are physicians who, who basically bridge that gap, right? From, from as you said, um, young teen to a uh, young adult. That's really an exciting thing to know. Um, so we have a couple of stats that I, uh, the American Sexual Health Association has graciously provided me with. And I'm wondering, Dr. Saslow, you know, we talked about um, HPV vaccinations and Dr. Trent said, you know, you provide that service, right? Um, but I'm curious about the percentage of adolescents who are um, receiving the HPV vaccination and why we see such a gap between those the HPV vaccine and some of the other vaccines that are appropriate for the 13 to 17 age range. So if we look at um, meningococcal uh, at 89% of vaccination rate or the Tdap at 92% of vaccination rate, um, we're only seeing 54% of our teens getting vaccinated for HPV. Why would you say that is? Uh, so there's not one reason. There are actually a bunch of reasons. Uh, one is that really, unfortunately, and so I, I commend this group, a lot of people don't want to talk about sex. A lot of pediatricians don't want to talk about sex to an 11-year-old. A lot of 11-year-olds don't want to uh, talk about sex with their mom in the room. Um, so you know, we really push out the message that HPV vaccination is to prevent cancer. It, it doesn't matter that HPV is sexually transmitted. The, the important point is that this vaccine prevents six types of cancer. Uh, another reason is that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of kids especially, there's a limit to how many shots they want to get in one day. Um, so for a lot of them, one shot in each arm and it's like, you know, anything else can wait. And so what uh, the American Cancer Society and the American Academy of Pediatrics um, have been uh, talking about a lot for the last few years is give that HPV vaccine the first dose at age nine, give the second dose at age 10. And then when these kids come in at 11 and 12, they can get their Tdap and meninge and maybe their COVID vaccine and their flu vaccine. Um, and so HPV vaccine is most effective between the ages of nine and 12. And the longer you wait after that, the less effective it becomes at um, preventing cancer. And then one more reason that I bet a lot of you can relate to, social media. You know, the HPV vaccine came out about 15 years ago and um, it just lit up uh, social media as far as, um, you know, we all know, misinformation on Facebook and um, other uh, social media platforms. So that's really unfortunate. Yeah, well, well, today we're gonna try to set the record straight. So all of you out there who are tweeting or posting on social media, please remember to um, post the, the good information. We wanna have um, our folks, you said at early as nine, um, to get their first shot, their second at 10, and then they can get all of the other um, adolescent shots 
from there. So that, that makes a lot of sense. We do have a question in the chat, Dr. Trent, if you have any recommendations of specific books that parents can read to their children. So for young children, I love this book called Where Did I Come From? It's a great book, <laughs> softy smiling, but it's a great book you can read with your, your actually young child. Um, it was really important for us to, to read to our children to make sure that they had some knowledge before we put them on that bus to go to kindergarten. And, um, and then they just, it's very accessible. It's very accurate. They have them in different ethnicities. There's one for, for example, African-Americans. So it's one of my favorites. Um, and then it has a follow-up text, What's Happening to Me, uh, which is the puberty book. And so I, I, I like, there are tons of them. That's just one that I've used and that I like here. Um, so I, I think that there are a ton of books that are really quite good. There's some for even adult women. So um, one of our colleagues has a book called um, Everything Your, 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 your Mother and Mom never told you about sex there's a great book out for adults to try to figure that out so i think that um it's about information so you know the question you're just asking dr saslow you know i think we thought for a long time it was because people were really worried about having a sex talk uh, you can actually give vaccinations and not talk about any of that you know you can just say you know these are shots you do today <laughs> these are side effect profile <laughs> this is what is happening um so i don't know that we have to make the the well visit bigger than it needs to be in order to give hpv vaccination what I will say is that people are also worried about safety and efficacy and those kinds of things. But I think that we do need to have these talks with young people about sex because I think young people want that information. And so it's, it's critically important that we make that transition. That's fantastic. I, I totally agree. I'm, I'm curious, Safi, from your perspective, you know, a lot of uh, you're around the same age as the folks in the show um, and maybe a little younger, but still within the demographic we're trying to hit. Um, how do you think your peers, I mean, we know you are getting a lot of your health information from your mom, your super mom, right? Um, but how are your peers getting um, sexual health information and how are they engaging um, if, if you don't mind sharing that? Yeah, no, so that's a great question. I think a lot of my like close friends kind of get information from their parents just because they have like open like relationships with them. Um, so that's a big thing. But a lot of them get it from social media, actually, which I think is really interesting. So like the Internet, because I think that's really big now, like using the in Internet to get all types of information. So Internet, parents, um, some of them are really close with their doctors, kind of like the character in the play, Frankie, like they're really close with their doctors. So they'll ask questions that they have from them. But um, that's just like people that I know personally and a lot of teenagers similarly, just parents. That's a big one. Awesome. That's great that a lot of teens are, are able to chat with their parents about um, all of these different topics. Um, Allegra, I, I'd love to get you into the conversation. You are uh, a, a survivor and we're so grateful to have you here today. I'm wondering if you could share just a little bit about your cervical cancer experience. And I know, I happen to know you have a daughter and I'm wondering if that relationship that we saw with Frankie and her mom, you know, advising her and keeping her um, uh, on top of her sexual health, if that translates into how you and your daughter um, engage. Oh, you're on mute, Allegra. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, our relationship is, is very open. We started talking when she was very small and talking about, you know, uh, the different things that she will, will experience as she will grow up. Uh, but my story, you know, started when I was a young mother and wife. And I just remember very vividly how it went so quickly from diagnosis to the treatment, which was a radical hysterectomy. And it, it was so quickly and it just changed my life completely. Just in, in, a, in a matter of a month, I, I learned about my diagnosis and then it moved on to, to the treatment. And recovery was slow, but with that said, I, I found my voice and was able to then pivot from that and be able to lean forward as an, as an advocate. What I think it's the most important thing is educating the providers as well, because for my daughter, for example, it took us a while for her to get the full treatment because she, she started with her first vaccinations when she was younger, but then getting the full gamut of all the, the vaccines was harder because 
the providers are not educated. And then within the work that we do as advocates, we partner with the Virginia Department of Health in order to have a campaign to educate the providers on the vaccination for HPV and also the screening for cervical cancer. That's great. I'm so glad. You know, I, I think it does go on both sides. And, um, you know, we have to have providers that are able to articulate what is needed. And then we have to have patients and parents who are open and um, advocating for for their uh, their patients. Um, I'm curious, you know, thinking about that, we had a question in um, on Instagram earlier today, and I'm thinking about access, um, Dr. Saslow, and and the American Cancer Society is is working to make sure that, you know, we have access and understanding around the HPV vaccine and we're we're curbing um, cervical cancer as best we can. I'm curious if you have any um, thoughts about cost um, for the vaccine and how we are making it accessible for folks. There was a question around, you know, is there a way to get the vaccine for free? Because it can be expensive depending on your insurance coverage. So I'm curious what your thoughts are there. So about half of uh, kids in the United States are covered by private insurance and all insurance has to pay for those vaccines that are recommended. Um, and so HPV is one of those. So if you have, um, or your children have private insurance um, and you're below the age of 19, you get this uh, vaccine uh, for free. And then um, now there may be a cost to a doctor visit. Um, I can't speak to that, but hopefully with insurance that covers that as well. Um, for the other half of the country, um, most of those are covered by something called the Vaccine for Children's Program. And again, this is up to age 19. Um, uh, for private insurance, they'll cover it through the age of 26. The Vaccine for Children's Program is a nationwide um, entitlement program that covers vaccines for those kids that are uninsured, for those kids that are seen in a qualified health center, and for um, anyone uh, covered through um, Indian Health Service as well. Um, and so it really shouldn't be um, a problem for the vast majority of uh, children and adolescents to get this vaccine. Um, now, if uh, a child, a young adult um, does not get the HPV vaccine on time or just a little bit late. Um, if they have private insurance, they can still get that covered. Um, and if they don't, then there is a cost and there are some programs uh, to help with that for the 19 to 26 year olds uh, through the manufacturer doesn't, not enough to cover everybody. Um, but that's just one more reason to get the vaccine on time uh, is to get it paid for. That's a great point, right? So as, as long as we're getting it in the right window, then it's covered mm -hmm. um, as far as we know for, for the vast majority of folks. Um, and then, you know, there is a question around, um, can you get the HPV vaccine as an adult? It's my understanding that 26 is the cutoff, but I'm wondering if either you or Dr. Trent could talk a little bit about the efficacy and how that um, sort of peters out as you get older and then why the 26 cutoff? Sure. So the 26 cutoff um, was just a result of the original studies done by the vaccine manufacturers. They were done in 19 to uh, 9 to 26 year olds. And that's why we say the vaccine starts at age 9 and not 8. Um, and then more recently, uh, the manufacturers did some studies in what we call mid adults. So 27 to 45 year old. Uh, men and women, but really after age 17 or 18, vaccine effectiveness goes way down. Um, and so uh, we'll prevent over 90% of HPV cancers when we give the vaccine on time. If we give it at age, say, 17 or 18, it drops to below 50%. Um, and by 21, it's down around 15%. So if you're a provider and you're seeing a patient and you're telling them or advising a parent, should my child get it now or should they wait? You say, well, do you wanna prevent almost all cancers or just a few cancers? Now, if the efficacy and effectiveness is that low in the 20s, then 
can only imagine what it would be at 30 or, or 40. So the recommendation is not that um, adults get vaccinated. The recommendation that is that if an adult age 27 to 45 is interested in the vaccine or has questions about the vaccine, then their provider should talk to them about whether or not um, that person should get vaccinated. So for, you know, as an individual, they may say, hey, I'm in a certain risk group or this is how I feel about this and I really want it. Whereas somebody else might say, okay, you know, it's safe, but it's probably not gonna help me. That's really, really helpful to understand. Um, Dr. Trent, I'm curious, when you are guiding parents and patients, how do you broach this subject? I know you just said that you don't necessarily have to talk about sex during a wellness visit, um, but if you if that does come up, or how, how do you quell pa parents' concerns around um, this being uh, associated with some promiscuity or, or of some kind? I know that that is not true, but we wanna set the record straight here today. Well, I just first have to the disclaimer that I talk about sex all the time in the office with people. So, uh, you know, it really starts with the 11 year old. I actually asked, the, I actually asked the adolescent in front of the parent. So, so what has your parent told you about, you know, if it's period, so your body changing. So what, what have you had to talk? And so parents know that from then on, I'm going to talk about it at every visit. And then I expect updates. Sometimes I assign people to go out to lunch and talk to their child about it. So I'm, I'm talking about it all the time, but I don't think it just, I just don't think it has to be a barrier. The second thing I'll say is that, the, that this is really a gift. I tend to think of vaccination as a gift. Um, it's a theme that I'm going with now, even in the present related to some other vaccines. It's not really just age. Um, the reason those vaccines don't work is because those people have already been exposed to the virus. And so it's not as effective because they've already had virus exposure. So the reason to give a vaccine to a nine-year-old, an 11-year-old, or 12-year-old is because the age of sexual debut is really after that in the United States for most young people. So if we can give people the vaccine before they're exposed to any vaccine types, the vaccine is most effective. So this is really a gift that parents can give to their children to give them the vaccine before they even have any contact with it. I'd like to, to think about how we give hepatitis B vaccination to newborns, right? So no one looks at their infant and says, oh, I think that you might have unprotected intercourse with someone or that you might use I, uh, you might have used intravenous drugs. Nobody thinks about that when they look at that beautiful newborn, but day of one or two of life before they go home, they get their first hepatitis B injection. It's the same adjuvant. So from a safety perspective, we have to really convey that these are the same kinds of materials that we're giving to our newborns to protect them um, from harm in the future. And so that's really how I like to set it up for parents so that they understand the importance of timing, safety, efficacy, um, and that it's really a gift that you can give your children. Wow, that is a powerful way to frame it, a gift that you can give your children. And also, you know, there are so many vaccines that we take for granted that we just have and um, ensure that our, our children have them before they go to school, you know, at all these different stages of life. And so this is just another one of those. Um, you know, I'm curious about uh, Allegra, your experience, you know, the vaccine may or was the vaccine available um, before you were diagnosed? And if not, um, you know, what did you know about cervical cancer before your diagnosis? So the vaccine was not available uh, when I was diagnosed. I was diagnosed uh, back in 1999. And um, to be honest, I didn't even know where my cervix was. Uh, so uh, I always explain to, to everyone uh, since then, uh, that the cervix is the, the lower part of, of your womb and it connects your, your womb to your vagina. So that's my FYI. And definitely I read a lot. I went online at the time and tried to find information about uh, my diagnosis. And I wasn't able to find information at the time. I wasn't able to connect with anyone at the time that there were not groups like the ones that are support groups that they are like now. And there was not this program from ASHA and CCC where this is a community of survivors. So definitely we've come a long way in the last 21 years. So I'm really happy to be part of that group over. Thank you. I'm so, I'm so glad that um, 
you are doing well and that you've learned all of these new things and now you've become an advocate. You went from patient to advocate. That's such a powerful story. Um, I'd like to transition just slightly because we've been talking a lot about women, um, a lot about in general, making sure that our um, adolescents receive this, our children receive this, but we haven't talked specifically about gender. And I know that this vaccine is particularly um, targeted for all genders, not just for females. And I, I'm curious, um, Dr. Saslo, can, can you talk to us a little bit about why um, every, all genders should be, um, you know, this is recommended for all genders. And also, you know, let's, connecting it to the play, like, we have this farce that's happening in the show, right? And Lucas is totally left out of the conversation. But all of the women have this sort of secret language that they have, and we have learned as women to sort of cover up our periods, cover up these conversations. Um, so I'm curious, how, what are we doing to combat that stigma or that, um, sort of one one view of the genders receiving this vaccine? Well, fortunately, um, almost as many boys now are getting the HPV vaccine as girls. Um, so in the beginning, there was a big gap because it was approved first in girls. And that's because worldwide, cervical cancer is one of the most common cancer killers of women. Um, so, But in the United States, there are more men that get throat cancer caused by HPV, then there are women who get cervical cancer. Uh, now, I mentioned that the vaccine protects or prevents six types of cancer. Uh, some of those are exclusively in uh, persons who were born with female <laughs> biological parts. Uh, so cervical, vaginal, vulvar, and in men, penile. Um, but in both genders, in both sexes, uh, anal and throat, and throat is much more common in men uh, than in women. And so in addition to that, um, you know, we're talk, I work at the American Cancer Society, so I talk a lot about cancer, um, but there's a rare but really awful uh, disease called respiratory uh, papillomatosis. Um, and so the vaccine prevents against that and against genital warts. And when you talk about, you know, girls not wanting or wanting or not wanting to talk about um, their periods. Boy, boys do not want to talk about genital warts. They do not want to get genital warts and they would rather avoid genital warts than death. Uh, so, um, so the vaccine has almost eliminated genital warts in those countries where they have really high vaccine rates like Australia. You, you just don't see it anymore in the United States. Um, it's really dramatically declined. So over 90% of genital warts are prevented uh, by this vaccine. Wow, that's a really powerful statistic. So um, an another great reason to make sure that both genders or all genders um, are, are vaccinated. Um, you know, you bring up this really great point. We, we talked a little bit in the show, you know, they brought up herpes and kind of compared herpes just to mono, right? Uh, Nadia is just saying, come on, get out of the thing. And one of the great things I really um, like about the script is that Frankie then says, no, 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 I can't say that because I'm intimately involved with multiple people. And that would cause a ripple effect that would be pretty dramatic um, for the for the, the team, right, her, her lacrosse team. And so when we think about communication and talking about um, our things with our partners, Safi, I'm, I'm looking at you in terms of communication. What types of um, tactics or ideas do you have around making uncomfortable or potentially embarrassing conversations less embarrassing? And, you know, how do you keep that open line of communication? With your peers um you know i feel like the idea of being embarrassed is something that all teenagers want to avoid at all costs like to do anything to avoid being embarrassed because the feeling is just like awful but i know when it comes to your health like that needs to be obsolete like your health is most important even if you're a little bit embarrassed to kind of bring it up so like even if you're not really comfortable with your doctor for example talking about something that you really need to kind of talk about um you know maybe just don't make eye contact with them or something just so you can get it off your chest or maybe have a conversation over text with your mom or something like that about something that's really been bothering you with your health. But um, I think that communication is super important because when it comes down to the line, like everyone wants to see you be healthy and successful. So, you know, even if it's like avoiding eye contact or like maybe not an in-person conversation, but like getting that conversation in, 
whatever you have to do is really important. So that's just kind of my little suggestions, I guess. You seem to be a wise, very wise among your peers. I'm curious, do you ever get embarrassed? And then, and then how do you recover? You know, how does that, how does that work? I mean, your mom is this superhero physician and talks about sex all the time. So how, does that ever embarrass you with your peers? Um, I'm just curious to understand how do you, how do you pivot? How do you bounce back? Um, I feel like my ability to bounce back comes from being embarrassed so much. Like it just happens so often, I guess, to me. So I'm just like used to it and kind of like laughing it off is my favorite thing to go. Like this is a serious topic. I'm uncomfortable, but we're going to laugh it off because now we're on the same like page, if that makes any sense. So I don't know. I feel like just how often I get a little bit embarrassed and uncomfortable, but it's also like helping my tolerance. So it's like, like I get embarrassed by things so easily anymore because you know, the level of seriousness that something is, but in the end, just laughing it off always works in my situation. So <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Laugh it off, laugh it off. So the, the suggestions we heard for those of you out there who might be looking for tactics are to maybe not make eye contact, use text, use your other forms of communication so that you can get things off your chest. Um, and then when in doubt, laugh it out. <laughs> That's what it sounds like from Safi. Thank you. That's super, super helpful. Um, you know, we have so many different people on the line. We have like these different demographics, right? We've got teens, we've got young adults. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Sassel, you called it the middle, middle age. What did you call it? What did you call it? Mid adults, <laughs> mid adults, mid adults. Um, and, and many of those people are parents right um, now, and they may have young children and, and they're trying to um, figure out how do you have these conversations and, and things like that. Um, uh, Allegra, I'm curious, when you first started chatting with your daughter and, and making your diagnosis known and, and things like that, what kinds of communication tools did you use to um, impart the importance of sexual health? So full disclosure, it took me a while from diagnosis and treatment to being able to talk about my survivorship and what I went through. But once I started, I couldn't stop talking. So uh, one of the tools was mainly communicate in forms such as this, being involved in the community. Anyone that gives me an opportunity to talk about survivorship, HPV vaccination, screening, I do it. And my sound bite to everyone is that you have to be your own advocate for your health, right? When you have a consultation, there are two experts in the room the doctor, which is the expert on the science, and you, the patient, you are the expert on your health history and on your body. Don't allow anyone to uh, make you feel that you don't know what you're talking about or do you, you don't know what you're feeling and make sure that you have the right to fire your doctor if he's not or she or he are not helping you achieve your wellness and your health program. Excellent. I, I love that, that, that empowered um, space that you're taking up, you know, once you understand your body and you're willing to talk about it, um, then you become one of your, one of the biggest advocates for, for your health. So that's a really powerful um, statement. Um, wanted to give a plug to everybody in the the chat if you have any questions feel free to shout them out for us um safi you've got some shout outs already in the chat some folks are, are talking about how brilliant you are um and your wisdom is uh transcending so thank you for sharing all of that with us um you know when we think about transitions from um dr trent you know you shepherd um, youth into their young adulthood. How does the handoff go from the pediatrician and you bring welcoming that patient into your practice? And then how do you hand it off? Or is there a connection between your the the next phase of their um, health? Most definitely. So we have a introduction to our practice. So they're during that first visit, um, usually people are around 11 or 12, um, hopefully sometimes a little later. 
Um, we really spent a lot of time talking with them about how our practice works, how it may be a little more different than the practice they were going to before. We prepare parents to step out of the room. One of the biggest things that young people need is space. They need an opportunity to talk to the doctor by themselves. And so at the 11 year old visit, it's not long, it's not much, it's not heavy. It's just this opportunity to practice talking to the doctor by yourself. And so by the time you leave us at 25, you really are a master of your own ability to navigate the visit. You know, many of our 15, 16 year olds come by themselves to the office. And if we need to call the parent for something, we will. And so they're really navigating um, clinical care very independently. Uh, we decided to keep our patients. We used to transition them at age 21, uh, but we decided to keep them longer because some of them, particularly young people who had chronic health care conditions, really needed a stable medical home um, because they were transitioning to subspecialty care into adult care. And they really needed somebody who was going to be an advocate for them and really help them manage the transition successfully. And so it has worked out really well. Uh, we have tons of young adults who are still coming to see us in practice. I I really enjoy them. Um, they are really making important moves and decisions. We have people who have graduated from college. It's great. And so we have that 11 year old who is, you know, new to everything to the 25 year old who's really getting ready to the next step for the next step. And for them, we will set them up, identify women's health person for them if they're a young woman, as well as an internist for them to see and, and try to make that transition really very smooth for them um, for that process. But I think that young people just don't want to feel, I don't know, that there's there's no connection that, to that next space. And so I think helping them with that has been critically important. Absolutely. I think, you know, even for me, if I move or if I go somewhere else, I'd love to have that connection. You know, our, our health systems have a lot of opportunity, I think, to, to connect with one another and to make sure that we're supporting patients as they transition. So I love that you're creating independent, um, you know, personal health advocates for themselves as they go throughout your practice and as they grow. That's really tremendous. Um, uh, Dr. Saslo, I I'm thinking about, you know, American the American Cancer Society and they're probably setting some of the agenda towards how we are viewing cervical cancer, how we're preventing it, how we're getting the word out there. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of the, the tactics and some of the things that you're doing to encourage an increase in HPV vaccination as well as um, research or anything else that we should know about um, cervical cancer prevention? Sure. So. Uh, HPV vaccination and uh, cervical cancer and HPV cancer prevention is a very high priority to the American Cancer Society, right up there with tobacco cessation um, and colorectal cancer uh, screening. And so, you know, we could go out there person to person, parent to parent, but if you go, most people do get their medical information from their provider. Um, so teens get it from their parents, the parents get it from the providers. Um, and so if we go to the providers um, and talk to them about how do you recommend the HPV vaccine, recommend it the same way as the other vaccines at the same time as Tdap and Meninge, well, then each provider is gonna be reaching hundreds of patients. Then if you go to the health system, and most providers are not out there in their own practice, then you can reach hundreds or even thousands of providers who then reach. Um, and so we go to primarily to the systems. We help them with quality improvement. You know, one of the biggest ways to improve vaccination uh, and, and pretty much any kind of uh, utilization of, of uh, health recommendation is to show them their data. If, if you ask the typical provider, not Dr. Trent, um, but your average provider, you know, what's your vaccination rate for preteens? Um, and they'll say it's high. <laughs> they'll say, well, well, how high? <laughs> and they'll make up some number and then you look at the data and it, well, actually it's about half that. So you, you think you're vaccinating 90% of your patients, but you're really at 50%. And that's very eye-opening. And so most of the time they'll resist and they'll say, no, that data is wrong, but you just show them. It's really effective to say, here's what your percent is and here's every other doctor in the practice. Um, and then, you know, people tend to be really competitive. 
Um, maybe they'll go ask the person who is at 90% how they did it. Um, we also work with payers um, to make sure. So um, the different insurance companies, again, you, you get it, the biggest numbers. So we have our priority audiences, payers, systems, um, providers, and parents. Um, and so we really focus on on-time vaccination, nine to 12. Once they're older teens, they do make a lot of health decisions for themselves. They do go to their parents and say, I want this. I want to be protected. But for the younger ones, we're really focusing on the parents. Um, we do go um, work with uh, social media. We have communications campaigns. And um, very importantly, we work with partners. So one of the things the Cancer Society does is run a national roundtable of all the organizations that have anything to do with cervical cancer prevention and HPV cancer prevention and vaccination. So every doctor's group, nurses group, every other type of provider group, as well as survivor groups, advocates, researchers, industry, hospitals, payers. Um, and so, um, you know, some of that impact is um, getting them all to work together, uh, and getting them to focus on the same thing, which is prevent cancer. That's wonderful. I, I love this sort of tiered or trickle down um, concept, right? So starting with the largest impact first and, mm -hmm. and trying to make sure that the message gets down to all the way to the, mem the patient, the parent, and then the patient. Um, it sounds like a really effective mechanism. I, um, I, I'm also really interested if there's any, um, a conference or something like that that you recommend for folks out there? I know we have providers in the audience. I know we have um, folks who work for health plans and, and payers and other, um, you know, folks involved in the audience. And so if you have any of those recommendations, you can shoot them my way. We do have a resource page on our website. So if uh, there are books you recommend, Any to, this is to any of our panelists, if there are books you recommend, if there are... Um, websites, causes to, to look into or um, advocacy groups that we can donate to, things of that nature. We're really uh, very happy to have those be a part of our resource page so that folks can continue the conversation after the curtain goes down and the Zoom room goes out, right? Um, but we are starting to wrap up the evening. So I'd love to do a quick round robin of each of you and think about um, your call to action. We always end the evening um, with a call to action to inspire our audience to, you know, we've educated everyone, I think, uh, up to this point. I'm really excited for all the information that was shared, but it'd be really great to understand, um, you know, what is your one recommendation what is the most important thing women should do to take care of themselves? What's the most important thing any gender could do to take care of their sexual health? Um, and then what is your call to action? So if, if um, you know, Safi, what's your call to action to your fellow um, youth out there? Why don't we start with you? Um, I feel like the biggest thing for me is just talk about it, like communicate about it. Like I know there's really weird stigmas about like, oh, we're going to hide our periods or random things that happen that are completely natural. Like my biggest thing is just talk about it. And I don't know. I don't know how to describe my call to action. But, you know, if you're with your doctor, just do it. Just communicate about it. Like just get it out in the air that you'll you can only benefit from that, you know, so. Only benefit. I love that. You can only benefit from, you know, putting it out there, communicating. And, you know, we already heard, you know, use these different forms of communication. Make sure that you've um, you, you just go for it. Right. Like it's an empowerment. Go for it. Um, I love that. Thank you so much. Allegra, what would your call to action be for either survivors or um, parents out there, et cetera? So my call to action would be, don't be afraid, right? Um, even when you are not sure of where to go, who to call, reach out, search it, Google it, just be persistent as well. Be, be a nuisance. When someone tells you no, then get a second opinion, move out and to echo Safi, communicate, right? Um, be, be bold in, when it comes to your health. 
Oh, this is so I'm I am inspired tonight. This is so great because you are all giving me um, so much that I'm going to take on in my life. So being bold, that communication, you know, really putting things out there. Um, Dr. Trent, what is your call to action or what's the one important thing you would like either teens or parents to to know about their sexual health? Just on this theme, <laughs> vaccination is a gift. <laughs> it's a gift, not just for HPV. It's a gift in general. It has changed our society. We are healthier. We live longer. We are really, really fortunate in the United States in particular to have that resource. Um, I do work in overseas and there are countries that don't even have access to what we have. It is profound, the number of cervical cancer deaths in um, low-income countries. So it doesn't have to happen, right? Um, the second thing I'll say is I'm going to go with my daughter. I, I think you should, A, if you're a parent, talk to your kid about sex. Uh, if you're an adolescent, talk to your parents about sex. Even when it's uncomfortable, um, you can look away, but stay there and listen to it. I love that. And the other thing is find a doctor that meets your needs. Um, if you're a young person, there's a whole field called adolescent medicine. They, I am not a, a unicorn. There are tons of people around this country who are just like me. If you want to find us, you can go to the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine's website. Uh, many of us are also a part of the American Academy of Pediatrics. There are tons of us. And find, find a doctor that works well with your young person. We can do tons of stuff for them and see them through into young adulthood. Beautiful, beautiful. Find a doctor, talk about it, and vaccines are a gift. I, I am so grateful for that short, sweet, and very powerful message. And Dr. Sasso, last but not least, what is your call to action? Well, uh, my message to everybody is prevention, value prevention. Don't wait until you're sick. Don't wait until you have symptoms. Um, go in and prevent cancer, whether it's through screening, vaccination, prevent all diseases, uh, we, we can do that. Um, and then I'll give a call to action out there to providers. Assume parents want to protect their kids, assume women want to protect themselves. And so go in with the recommendation, okay, you're due for this vaccine or your daughter's due for this vaccine, which arm do you want it in? Don't get into this whole conversation about, Oh, I know you may have seen something on Facebook and do you want this? Just, just assume. If they have questions, they'll ask. If they have concerns, they'll ask, but assume they don't unless they bring it up. Great. Assume that they are ready and willing to uh, receive the gift of prevention and the gift of vaccination. That's fantastic. Um, thank you all so incredibly much. This has been a wonderful conversation. I think the beautiful play that Sabrina Jacob Washburn wrote has given us a window into this incredible conversation. I think we got a little bit of the, the stigma off of periods of sexual health, of HPV, cancer prevention, vaccines. Um, it's really, really it been a, an exciting night. And unfortunately, we have to kind of bring this evening to a close, but I think we've put a lot of great information into the world, and I'd love to thank everyone who has been a part of this evening's event. Um, cast of Runneth Over, please join us back on the Elevate virtual stage so we can applaud you one more time for your tremendous effort, your tremendous uh, performances this evening. We are so, so grateful. Um, you're talented, and you put your heart and soul into this work, and so I am so, so grateful. Um, to Sabrina, your play was hilarious and it was relatable. And again, it opened this door for this conversation. So we've got a lot of praise in the chat for both the writing and the acting and the panel. And I'm just so grateful that we were able to bring you all together today. Um, I'd love to thank all of our panelists, um, Dr. Saslow, Dr. Trent, uh, Allegra, and Safi, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your time and dedication to this topic, to your patients, to your the, the patients that you advocate for, et cetera. I'm, I'm just very overwhelmed and grateful for this. I'd also love to thank the American Sexual Health Association. Um, 
<laughs> Deborah Arundel and Amy Huang have been tremendous partners in this work. I could not have asked for a better partner for Elevate to bring this topic to our virtual stage. I hope this leads to many, many more collaborations in the future and much more sexual health information being relayed to our audiences stigma free. Um, I'm so, so, so grateful for this. Um, behind the scenes, we have a, a couple of folks. Tess, thank you for your captions tonight. Um, Alberto, thank you for your stage management. And Wes, your moderation and technical expertise. We just so, so grateful. Finally, I want to thank the audience. All of you, you have been here, you've been engaged in the chat, you've been open and paying attention to this really important topic. And, you know, I know there is a lot that's going on in the world. There's a lot from a health context, right? There's a lot going on politically. There's a lot going on in general, in our everyday lives as we navigate all of the things we need to navigate. And we navigate the pandemic, right? That's like a whole new kettle of fish that we're all trying to figure out now. And I just wanna say thank you for spending an evening with us. Thank you for posting and tagging us on social media and getting the word out there about this important topic. I wanna to thank you for all of the contributions that you make by asking questions, by you know inviting your friends, et cetera. Elevate is committed to bringing you professional and relatable storytelling um, and trusted health and wellness expertise. Your presence here tonight in droves totally demonstrates that the demand for that is real. We want to do more of it. <laughs> so if you like what you saw this evening, please consider making a tax deductible donation to Elevate Theater Company through our fiscal sponsor, Fractured Atlas. Uh, we'll drop that link in the chat so you have it. But overall, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being here. We hope that you laughed. We hope that you connected. We hope that you learned a little something new and that you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone, and be well and elevate. Have a great night. <laughs>